Hello, all you three of my eat bags out there. How is everybody doing today? Huh? You doing good? Having a good week? Getting a lot of stuff done? I'm just sitting here with my guitar. Working on new material. Always working on something new. Um, let's see, what am I working on today? This is my day. I'm working on a soundtrack for a film that I have to have to the director by tomorrow. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a new cover song that I'm going to finish. Actually, I'm working on two cover songs simultaneously, but one is closer to being finished than the other. And I plan on releasing that the day after tomorrow, probably. Um, which means that I'm gonna have to get some artwork together for the YouTube video. So I have to do that too. Uh, let's see, what else am I working on? Well, I guess the soundtrack is gonna take up most of my day. You know, I don't have much time to talk, obviously, because I'm, I gotta get to work, but I'll always make time for my happy innovators. So, maybe I'll play a little guitar for you. This is one of my favorite chords right here. I don't know the name of the chord. I just know where to put my fingers. It's one of the chords from the song um, Oh Holy Night, which is one of my favorite Christmas carols. I think it's just uh, a beautiful piece of music, and the chords are like... Actually, those are the same chords from Through the Storm, the song I wrote a while ago. So I'm always, always playing around on this guitar. This old beater piece of crap, technically. Acoustic guitar that I've had since I was a child. You know, it just was one of those things that was kicking around my house and um, no one cared about it and I just took care of it. You know, I always made sure that it was in working order and I always played it and I still play it. It's been on almost every song I've ever recorded. Actually, if I didn't uh, play this guitar, this very guitar on every song, I at least wrote every song on this guitar. It's always the first thing I reach for when I'm looking for something to do or to fill up time. I spend a lot of time just screwing around and playing the same old chords I always play just trying to come up with a different combination. Yeah, Guitar is actually a really weird instrument for me in a lot of ways because I don't really know how to read music and I don't really know the names of the chords and I'm not a virtuoso player. I just kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm able to hear something and mimic it. A little bit of information that no one really probably cares about, but if you're a guitar player, you probably do. Anyway, put this thing down. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about this idea that I had. Um, I guess I'm going to call this uh, thought experiment number three. Because, um, because I guess in lieu of that last singularity episode that I released last week, um, you know, I was talking a little bit about spirituality and those kinds of things. And uh, I've had this idea for a long time to talk about this this passage in the Bible that I've been thinking about for years and years and years. And uh, I guess, you know, now is the time to kind of hope anyway that my audience won't mind if I actually share with you this passage from the Bible that really has me asking this really strange question. And as far as I know, I think I'm the only person I've ever heard who's really talked about this or or ask this question, okay? So without further ado, I'm gonna bust out my Bible here, my uh, Douay Reims Bible, 
and read for you this passage, okay? I'll read it first and then I'll tell you the question that I ask, okay? Now, this particular passage is at the end of the book of John, okay? And uh, just to kind of set it up for you a little bit, um, Jesus and Peter have just finished talking about Peter's destiny. You know, Jesus has kind of foretold how Peter will die, and um, you know, he's shared with him that information. And of course, that is exactly how Peter died. Um, but this passage that I'm going to read to you picks up right there, right after Jesus gets done explaining to Peter what his destiny will be. And so Jesus is there, and with him, he has Peter and he has John. Okay, obviously, this is from the book of John. And this is one of the very last passages of the book of John. Now, the Apostle John, to me, has always been kind of an interesting character, maybe more so than all of the other apostles, because when you read the scriptures that John wrote, he, for some reason, was granted, probably by Jesus, um, the privilege of referring to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Okay. And I always thought that was kind of humorous almost because every so often throughout the book of John, he'll drop that in there, you know, uh, as he's talking about something, he'll refer to himself as the one whom Jesus loved the most or the one who Jesus loved, you know, and none of the other apostles say that, okay? And I would imagine that the relationship with Jesus and John was probably a special one considering that while Jesus was on the cross, he gave his mother to John and marshaled John to take care of his mother after he was gone. Okay. And so there is an interesting relationship there that I've always kind of smiled about when I read it or think about it. But okay, back to this passage and I'll just read it to you really quick. And then I'll ask my question. Okay. It's uh, titled the beloved disciple. Okay. Peter turned and saw the disciple following whom Jesus loved, the one who had also reclined upon his chest during the supper and had said, Master, who is the one who will betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? And Jesus said to him, Peter, what if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? You follow me. So the word spread among the brothers that that disciple would not die, John. But Jesus had not told him that he would not die, just what if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? It is this disciple who testifies to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did. But if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. Okay, so Okay, so now I'll give you my synopsis and my question here. Okay? That I've thought about just over and over again for years. Okay? Now Jesus expressly says to Peter, "What if I want John to live until I return?" Like, and that would mean like now. You're like all the way to now. Okay. So my question is this, 
this is something I think about. Thought experiment number three. Okay. Um, is it possible? Okay. Is it possible that John, the apostle, never died? Is that possible? Is that what is being implied in that passage? That all of the other apostles would die, but the one whom Jesus loved the most and probably would ask the most of, okay, was never going to die a human death. Now, you may or may not believe the Bible and you may not even believe in Jesus, and I understand that, okay? But I do believe in the Bible and I do believe in Jesus. And I read this passage and I think to myself, what an interesting idea. Is that possible? Okay. That John the Apostle is still walking the earth. Now, if that is possible, and let's, let's just say for the sake of discussion today, that it's true that John the Apostle never died. Okay. Have we ever met him? Have we ever seen him? Like, what would be the purpose of John living forever? Obviously, you know, he would be sent out into the world to continue what Jesus had started. But it just makes me wonder in my imagination. Okay. Is John the Apostle still walking around like he never died? Think about it. Is that what that passage implies? You know, there's a reason why that statement, and I'll read it for you again, just that that statement uh, in the red letters, you know, what if I want him to remain until I come? Like, what concern is it of yours? I guess there's, that's another, I guess another side thought that I think about that passage is like when someone makes a judgment about someone else and they go, oh, they, you know, they're, they're going to go to hell. Uh, you know, they're an evil person or whatever. Okay. That might be a practical distinction. It might be a discernment that a person has, and that's fine. But if you go to this passage here. Basically, what Jesus is saying is, it's none of your business. You know, what I choose to do, how I judge a soul is none of your concern. You worry about you and I'll worry about him. You know, don't you worry about other people. You worry about yourself. And man, that's probably a lesson that whew, most Christians would probably be doing them a service by paying attention to, you know, that's a whole separate conversation, but it's all contained in that one little passage. But again, I'll ask the question, is it possible? Is it, is it, is this passage in the Bible very briefly mentioning this possibility that John never died? So I think about that a lot. Like, is that possible? Have I ever met him? Have I ever seen him? You know, think about it. Um, and I guess, you know, that leads me to another idea that I have that I want to talk about. And what I want to talk about is, okay, okay, since we're on the topic of Jesus and the Bible for today, okay, we all know that belief in Jesus is a faith-based thing, okay? We have to have faith in Jesus, okay? It's not certain knowledge, okay? You have to have faith. That's the point, okay? But imagine if there was a photograph of Jesus for people to look at, you know? Would it make it easier for people to believe, okay, if there was literally a photograph of Jesus Christ, okay? Well, it turns out there is, okay? <laughs> At least as far as I believe, okay? And what I want to talk about is the Shroud of Turin, okay? Now, the Shroud of Turin is 
a piece of cloth that was discovered um, a long time ago, and it's believed to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, the only reason that we're even talking about this particular piece of fabric, okay, is that this piece of fabric contains a photographic negative of Jesus Christ in the tomb. Okay. Now, it's a matter of faith, okay, because there are some people who say that the shroud is fake, that it was made in medieval times. It doesn't date back to the time of Jesus. And there are people on the other side of the argument who have tested it as well. And they claim that no, in fact, it does actually go back. This piece of fabric with this image on it dates back to the time of Jesus. Okay. So it's authentic, of course. And that harkens back to what I was mentioning in the last episode about the war of ideologies. Okay. You either believe or you don't. And it's just that simple. What do you believe? Okay. Well, I believe that the Shroud of Turin is real. Okay. That it is actually what they claim it to be. And the reason that I've come to that conclusion is, well, I'll tell you what, there are many reasons, okay? Now, ever since I was a young guy, probably in high school, I was fascinated with the Shroud of Turin, okay? So I've actually read books about it. I've, (laughs) you know, I've invested my time, my thought, and my energy into examining as much as I could about this particular artifact, okay? And um, without getting into the specific details, because, you know, I didn't do like, you know, I didn't make a bullet point like outline to read off of today, but I can tell you a few things offhand that I know about the Shroud of Turin, okay? And one of the things I can tell you is that it is the most studied and scrutinized artifact in the history of the world. Okay, so more people have examined this phenomena or this hoax, whatever you want to believe, uh, than any other thing in the history of the world. So think about that. Okay. And, you know, there's this scientific term called Occam's razor. Okay. And Occam's razor is a way of kind of cutting through the BS about something by framing the questions like, what is the simplest explanation? Okay, that's probably the accurate one. Whatever explanation is, the simplest is probably the one that is correct. Okay, so I would apply this idea of Occam's razor to this idea of the Shroud of Turin. Like there are all these people parsing out data and facts and arguing and carbon dating and amino acid tests and all these photographs and things and all this. And they argue about it, right? And they say it's either fake or it's real. And they have these huge extrapolated theories about how it got the way it is and, you know, whatever. Okay. But I say the simplest explanation is probably the accurate one. Now I'm one of those people that believes that the shroud is real. All right. And basically here's the question that I would ask you. Okay. If the shroud of Turin is fake, it's a, You know, it's bogus. It's not real. It was made in medieval times. It's just another piece of cloth. It's a hoax. All these things. If all of those things are true, then why are we still talking about it? Why is it still being studied as much as it is? I mean, let me tell you, look into it a little bit and you'll see what I mean. I mean, it is a 
it is a war over this artifact, okay? And if it's fake, then why are we still talking about it? Uh, I lean more towards, like, the reason we're still talking about it is because it's not fake. And it'll never stop being talked about. Just saying, that's kind of how I see it. And that's the question I ask. Anyway, now, if you're one of those people who says like, oh, like Jesus never existed, okay? Let me tell you something. Jesus did exist. He is a historical figure. There are records of Jesus, uh, and they're not just in the Bible, okay? So this idea that Jesus didn't exist, like the questioning whether he ever existed at all, is like a new thing, okay? Because even the people back in the day who questioned the divinity of Jesus never questioned whether he lived or not. They questioned his divinity or his claims, but they never doubted his existence. He existed, okay? So he is a historical figure and he died, you know, in a way that is illustrated for us in the Bible, okay? And it tells us the story um, even after he died, how he rose from the dead. And whoa, you know, these are the things that really just rattle people's foundations, right? Well, if the Shroud of Turin is real, if the Shroud of Turin is a photo documentation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay, which I believe that it is, then it contains everything that is faith-based about Jesus in one image, okay? Simultaneously, everything that was claimed by Jesus is proven by this image, okay? Now, if it's fake, it's fake, all right? Gotta concede to that, right? I gotta concede to it. Do I know for sure that the Shroud of Turin is real? No, of course I don't. There's no way I could ever know if it's definitely real, okay? But I believe that it is, okay? So in this image, when you look at the image, and it's a image that shows the front and the back, okay? So it's uh, the front part of Jesus's body from head to toe and the backside as well. So you can see everything. You can see all the whip marks. You can see the, where the nails went into his hands. You can see where the crown of thorns was placed on his head. You can see where he was pierced on the side. It is a comprehensive image, okay, from head to toe of a man who was crucified. Okay, that's what it is. It's so comprehensive, okay, and so detailed that forensic scientists, you know, the people who study uh, dead people and x-rays and those kinds of things of cadavers or whatever, uh, county coroners, you know, they can look at this image as if it were a person who they are examining. I mean, it's that it's that realistic. OK, so it is a biologically accurate image of a crucified man. Any way you slice it, that's what it is, whether it's fake or not, whether it's actually Jesus or not. It is a comprehensive image of a crucified man. OK, on the cloth itself. All right. It looks kind of like a white cloth with some stains on it, right? But for centuries now, we're talking about for centuries, it was understood and treated as if it was the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ, okay? And then one day, back in the what? I don't even know, like 1900. Or something okay there was this photographer his name was Segundo Pia okay and he wanted to take some photographs of this 
piece of cloth. Now, these were the first camera photographs of this cloth, okay? Now, this guy snaps a few pictures, right? On one of those old school cameras that looks like an accordion, you know? And he takes the photographic negatives into his dark room and he starts to develop the film. But what he realizes is the photographic negative plates that he has, okay, of this cloth contain the image of Jesus Christ on them. So when you look at the cloth with the naked eye, it looks just like a piece of fabric with stains on it. But when he photographed it and looked at it as a negative image, you could see the form of a man <laughs> who was crucified, okay? And you can actually see almost like an x-ray version of this human form. You can see the teeth underneath the lips. You can see the bones in the fingers. Like, whatever caused this image to appear onto this cloth, okay? was so powerful and so bright that it was actually like an x-ray. That's how that's how powerful this burst of energy was, okay? Now, for people who believe in the Shroud of Turin, they believe that the Shroud was made at the moment, the precise split second that Jesus was reanimating, was resurrecting, okay? This image is a shot of that moment, like bam, and the, you know, and there he was. Okay, he was back. He 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 had risen from the dead. Okay, and when you know the scientists all argue and break it down, you know, it would require a lot of energy probably to reanimate a human body, right? And um, like I was saying, that contained in this image, okay is all of the things that are faith-based about Jesus, all of the claims that he made, okay? Uh, he existed, he was crucified, he resurrected. You know, it's like, it's all contained in one image. Now, if it's fake, <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's really an amazing forgery. You know, considering that at the time that the shroud was made, like even if the claim that it was made back in medieval times by some artist or something, um, even if that claim were true, right? That would mean that they had knowledge of photography back in medieval times. <laughs> okay, so, you know, that would indicate that someone back in the day had figured out, okay, how to make photographs and if you think that that's what happened <laughs> yeah yeah cameras back in medieval times I don't think so okay I don't think so no 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 and uh, so it's just one of those things I've thought about and I've read about and actually there's a guy who was on the original team of photographers and scientists that were sent to officially study the Shroud of Turin for the first time, okay? They were given permission by the Vatican to go and photograph this artifact, okay? And examine it scientifically, okay? And they took, you know, little samples of the cloth and, you know, they actually cut pieces of it off to study and to examine. And they took photographs, uh, uh, you know, apparently the cloth was like uh, like two plies, so they were able to stick cameras in between the pieces of fabric and photograph and you know take measurements and do all these things. So it was a it was a comprehensive study of this piece of cloth. Okay, and the photographer that was on that team of people, his name, his name was Bernie Schwartz. Okay, now this is a guy I've actually had conversations with. All right, I've talked to him, and uh, very nice guy, very gracious guy, and um, you know, 
I don't think to this day he has publicly stated that he believes that the shroud is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus. Okay. Because I don't think that he can. <laughs> okay. Uh, like uh, back to that war of ideologies, you know, if you want to keep the grant money coming in, if you want to keep your career, okay, you can't state definitively one way or the other. Okay. You have to remain objective. And uh, so I think that that's what you have with this guy. Okay. But my impression from him, okay, and I could be wrong, okay, but my impression was that he at least believed that there was no logical or rational explanation for how this image got on the cloth. Okay, it's not paint. They've, been, they've studied this thing, you know, they have, they have, they have broken it down, you know, so much. Okay, so it's not paint and I, I you know, it's not faked. Okay, it can't be faked. That's that. I believe that's what his position is, is that whatever it is, whether it's the burial cloth of Jesus, he doesn't know uh, for sure. But he knows for sure that it can't be forged, that this, whatever this image is, whatever made this image is inexplicable. There's no explanation. It can't be repeated. Okay. Anyway, what I want to say is this, is that if the Shroud of Turin is real, okay, then you have been handed a photograph of Jesus. You actually got a photograph of Jesus at the moment of resurrection in the tomb. You know, I'll, I'll say what the truthers say, which I, <laughs> is hilarious, but do your own research you know, and don't necessarily believe the scientists that claim, you know, they did a carbon dating test on the shroud and wow, what a surprise, what a shocking surprise that they dated it, you know, wrong, like back to the 1500s, you know, because I really thought that they would claim it to be the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, right? Didn't you? Because that's what scientists would normally do, right? Of course not. The war of ideologies. The last thing that science will ever say about the Shroud of Turin is that it is definitively authentic. That will never, ever be uttered. It will never happen. But, you know, just like everything else, right? Of course, they're not going to say that. They can't. They can't. They, they won't. They won't. It's my position that I believe that even if science knew the shroud was real, they would never say it. They would never, ever state it as fact. They wouldn't. So there you go. There's a couple of things that, you know, I just kind of think about from time to time. And let me tell you, you know, the shroud of Turin. Wow. That is something I could talk to you about for hours and hours and hours. I mean, there simply is not enough time to talk about all of the ins and outs of this phenomenon. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just don't have enough time to talk about all of it, but there's so much to this story. And like I said before, you know, make like the truthers and do your own research and you'll see what I mean. It is a fascinating, like no matter, no matter what, okay. The Shroud of Turin is a fascinating thing. Any way you look at it. So anyway, if you're not a Christian and you don't believe in Jesus, I would hope, okay, that you're at least open-minded enough to just hear me out and come along with me on the thought experiment, you know? And let me tell you, this is certainly not going to be the last thought experiment that I give you, but for now it is because I have to get back to work. So for now, this is Mike Bostwick from Pipe Choir Records signing off. And remember folks, if you want to keep what you've got, 
you've got to give it away. Take it easy. 